Welcome to The Vegan Pulse. I am your host, Nancy Arenas. Today, my guest is Harold Brown. Harold is a former beef and dairy farmer and spent over half his life in agriculture. After a health crisis forced him to confront the incidents of heart disease in his family, he went vegan. Living on a vegan diet led him to re-examine all of his previous assumptions about eating animals. He experienced a profound conviction that exploiting animals and killing animals for food is immoral. Harold is now a vegan activist and the founder of FarmKind. He is also one of the subjects of the documentary, Peaceable Kingdom. Stick around, I wanna introduce him to you. Hi, Harold, how are you? I'm doing well, how are you doing, Nancy? I'm doing good. Thank you for being on the Vegan Pulse. I surely appreciate it. Oh, Very it's cool. my pleasure. I'm honored to be here. And you're in, are you in upstate New York? Yes, upstate New York in the Finger Lakes region. Okay. I'm originally from New York, Brooklyn, New York, born and raised. So <laughs> there is a little kingship there, New York. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, Harold, you have quite... Uh, an experience and a journey and a tale to tell, but um, I would like you to start by sharing with us your journey into veganism. Okay, well, it all started. I was born on a cattle farm in southern Michigan a long time ago, and I was um, um, raised as any farm kid would be. Um, you know, I was indoctrinated into the lifestyle. And and I, I want to be clear, though, that I don't use the word indoctrinated as a pejorative. It's a, we are all indoctrinated by our parents and our community into, you know, a set of values, a set of beliefs, and a lot of them were good. But also things that were not so good and were also normalized. Um, so I took that path where I was, you know, we were raising cattle, I was in 4-H and all the typical things that, you know, farm kids do. And um, then, you know, I just did that for, well, um, about half my life. Um, 30 some years so that kind of dates me right there and uh, we um, there were you know certain things that happened to me as a kid that kind of gave me a perspective about um, my relationship to animals but how they showed up in the world too a um, the one thing in particular that happened when I was young was my grandfather, I was fourth generation, fourth or fifth generation on the farm. But my grandfather, he um, had bought a uh, Holstein steer. Well, we raised beef cattle and this is a dairy cow. So we've got this dairy steer uh, there and he was pretty big. Um, and they do get much bigger than beef cattle. As as they get a lot taller. And we named him Max. And I get home from school, and first thing you do, jump off the bus, run down, do chores, you know, feed the cattle, water them, whatever. And uh, Max was always the one cow that would come up to us and wanted to be scratched and, um, you know, spend time with us. Well, that's, you know, people say, well, why is that? so different well we have selectively bred um cattle for different purposes and dairy cattle need to be handled by humans to be milked so their temperament tends to be such as that they're not spooked by humans really they they can be herded much easily they can be handled easily especially if, if they've been handled and petted and cared for as calves on up and beef cattle, you really don't care about that. You just need to drive them. You know, they go out, do their thing on pasture, and then you drive them into a trailer and take them to slaughter. And uh, that's it. So 
they're they're different individuals by breeding. So Max was cool. He was the one we could pet. He was the one. one day he came home from school and he wasn't there. And my um, I asked my grandfather, I said, where is he? And he said, well, we had to send him off to be slaughtered. And, um, you know, it broke my heart. Uh, usually we slaughtered the cattle we ate. Uh, we uh, did on the farm. But he knew that my brother and I had made a connection. And uh, he wanted to spare us that. So <laughs> he had him sent away to a local um meat packer. And a week later, my dad went over, picked up this wrapped meat, you know, and it comes in this white paper packaging. And I don't exactly remember how I reacted when, to my parents when they brought the baskets in. But I do know that what they did is they took a wax, wax pencil and they wrote Max on all the packages. And then they put them at the one end of the freezer because we always had this huge freezer in the basement that had meat in it. And they put Max at one end. And we, I refused to eat him. And uh, they figured that was what would happen. And so if I wanted a steak or hamburger or something, I got it from the other end. And a lot of people say, well, you know, how could, the, why didn't you figure it out then? I was like eight years old nine years old, you know, and, you know, it just didn't, you may, you compartmentalize these things because that part of that indoctrination was not, it wasn't just my family, but it was also my church and 4-H, but also the community I grew up in, the neighboring farmers and my great uncles owned the farms around us. One had a dairy farm, one had sheep. And uh, so I had experience with those animals too, but also just this kind of ethos that they gave to me too. And, uh, but the interesting thing that I think the things that reinforced that worldview um, among them, the thing, that probably reinforced me that I was doing the right thing was television, <laughs> believe it or not. It was the commercials on television because at any given time, a commercial break, there was at least one commercial that's selling animal products. And while it's, you know, national chain fast food places, still, you know, it's hamburgers, you know, it's bacon, it's whatever. And, you know, I'm growing up during the Green Revolution. And uh, one of the mantras of the Green Revolution is feeding a hungry world. So I figured I'm doing good work, you know, as a kid. That's how I rationalized it. And, um, you know, there were other things, too. I mean, growing up in a farm in a rural area, I also hunted. And um, while I shot uh, squirrels and rabbits and things like that. I went deer hunting from the time I was 14 and, you know, on. And I never shot a deer because I'd be sitting out in a blind and those deer were just so beautiful. I was just in awe of them. And as much as I would try to make myself pick up my shotgun, I couldn't do it. And they would come up because you sit really, really still in a blind and they would come up and stick their nose in the blind and sniff me and stuff and I would just stay really still and look at them they'd walk away and I go just how beautiful is that and I take a lot of heat from my dad and my brother because their blinds were wherever they could see me um, and they say that would just tell them I fell asleep you know that was <laughs> because my dad would fall asleep sometimes in his mind so that was my default I fell asleep but I just couldn't shoot them. And then later on, uh, when I was early 30s, um, came to a time when my grandmother was going to sell the farm and um, I opted out. 
And um, I just knew there were a lot of family dynamics involved with this. And I left and I moved to Cleveland. I knew some people in Cleveland, Ohio. So I moved there and um, that's where I first ran into the word vegetarian. Never heard that word, four years of college. Never heard the word. Um, and um, not, not long after that, a year or two, I heard the word vegan, mystified by that. And, uh, but I just started reading everything I could because right from the get go, um, well, I worked as a mechanic there and my, the garage I worked at, one of the very first customers I worked with was this wonderful uh, young black woman. And she, uh, the garage I worked at, the mechanic after they worked on the car, it was kind of unique. It, we, it was an independent shop. And after you're done, we were expected to take the work order off and explain what we did and ask if there were any questions we could explain. And um, the, she had a bumper sticker on the back window of her car and says, I don't eat my friends. And they had little pictures of animals. And I said, so what does that mean? I honestly could not put that together. And he, she says, well, I don't eat my friends. And I said, so you're not a cannibal? And she goes, no. She says, I don't eat animals. And I said, oh, really? And she says, I said, so what's that? She said, I'm a vegetarian. I said, well, what's that? Well, I don't eat animals. I don't eat honey. I don't wear leather. And I'm going, oh, I said, that, I know what that is. My grandmother, who was born in 1900, she called people that were vegetarians, the word they, their generation used is they were called um, Pythagoreans. And I go, hey, you know, you're a Pythagorean. Well, she didn't know what that meant. And I said, well, Pythagoras was, well, was really a vegan. Most of the ancient Greeks who ran their academies um, required veganism for to be part of the academy. And um, so I said, well, where do you buy your food? Because I thought it was some kind of mystical thing. And she says, well, I go to the food co-op. There was this little co-op not far from where we live. And I went down there and checked it out and go, oh, it supports local food systems. I'm all about that because I'm not a fan of the Green Revolution. So I'm all in. So we signed up and um, my wife and I signed up. And then on our way out, there was a little, uh, this is before internet. <laughs> so there were uh, little tear off tags on a little poster for a vegetarian group. So I tore one off, called the phone number and went and that was the beginning. And that's when I started reading and, and stuff. And uh, the person who probably health-wise had the biggest impact on me was uh, this group had one big event as a fundraiser a year. And it was always the same speaker, which was Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn, because it's Cleveland. And we live not too far from the Cleveland Clinic but that was, uh, went to hear him and I'm like fascinated. I, it, and to kind of backtrack, when I was 18, I had a heart attack, but I was home alone and um, I didn't know what happened to me, but it was all typical symptoms, my left arm, my left jaw. I blacked out, woke up, I couldn't breathe, I'm laying on the floor and I didn't know I'd had a heart attack. I didn't know what this was, but each, being 18 years old, you're bulletproof anyway, so I get up, I'm doing fine. And I never told my folk, I didn't tell anybody. I just figured it was some weird thing that happened. It wasn't until my dad had his first heart attack years later that I knew what heart attack symptom was. It scared the crap out of me. So when I ran into Hesselstein, I'm just going, okay, I'm paying attention because heart disease was rampant in my family and I wanted to do what I could. So long story short, I reversed my heart disease and um, I'm doing really well now. And it's, uh, um, but I do want to make a distinction. In those years, um, I was on a plant-based diet. I always tell people I was on a plant-based diet 
And because the head wasn't connected to the heart yet. Okay, yeah, I understood this idea of animal rights theory, but it was so foreign to me. I couldn't make that connection. I, w I was sympathetic to it, and I could understand the arguments, but I hadn't made the connection myself. So I was, I told, I tell people now at that point, I was on a plant-based diet, but now that is being changed. So when you say plant-based in a marketing world right now, it just means it's majority plants. It could have some animal products in it, but we'll still market it as plant-based. So I can't use that term anymore, <laughs> but plant-based as per at that time, what T. Colin Campbell, how he used it. That's where I picked it up from was Campbell's work. So I was fine. It wasn't until a few years later that I adopted a steer at a uh, sanctuary here in New York. And um, I was thinking it was the second year after the adoption, I went to an event and I just had this interaction. And that's when it happened. That's when I understood that steer, his name was Snickers. He was the one woke me up and uh, if anybody wants a little more insight into that story it's in a documentary called um, Peaceable Kingdom The Journey Home which is made by Tribe of Heart and uh, anybody can watch it for free uh, on Vimeo or they can watch it for free on Tribe of Heart's website they have a viewing room there with all their documentaries so Right, because you, yeah, you were part hmm? of that documentary. Yes, yes, yes. And that was that was when when the documentary was first released. Um, that was what led me into this whole world of activism. And I was hired by a sanctuary to be um, kind of a spokesperson. And uh, later I went out on my own and uh, started doing this work. And there was a lot of it was spending time going to land grant colleges around the United States and uh, talking about basically the nuts and bolts of animal agribusiness, but bringing the ethical and moral arguments to it. And um, that's, well, everybody is, there's so much of the activist world is focused on welfare, which I really, it even bugs me that people call them welfareists because I had an, adopted a rescue pit bull who passed away recently, but I was a welfareist because I adopted him and welfare, the definition of welfare is to act in the best interest of that individual. Well, animal welfare as it's practiced in ag agribusiness and in land grant schools, because there's their textbooks. You can major in animal welfare in any land grant school. And, um, but when I see the activist world adopting this utilitarian idea of um, welfare and calling it welfare, it's not in the best interest of those animals. It's this utilitarian idea that, you know, the interest of the many outweighs the interest of the few. And that's why most activism focuses on factory farming or CAFOs, and which I've noticed, well, I've worked on living here near Ithaca, New York. Uh, I worked for 11 years at the um, co-op there, and I was a produce buyer for them and worked with local farmers around here. And the... Um, and I noticed just talking with customers uh, in there that I'd always, you know, part of it's a big part of my activism. It's not about hitting the biggest audience as you possibly can. It's about being a mentor to the person standing in front of you. So I would engage people and, you know, we'd have great conversations and, and stuff, but they always had this out that, you know, well, there's these welfare standards and blah, 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 and stuff. And, you know, 
it was like I was living in Portlandia. It was crazy, you know, it was just crazy the rationale people came up with. And, uh, <coughs> you know, and while I would argue what's the difference between the interest of that animal on a grass-fed operation, it only has 50 cattle near Ithaca compared to a CAFO or feedlot operation like Howard Lyman ran, who, you know, there isn't. The individual is the individual. It's not about numbers or scale. It's about the rights of that individual because if you, it's like this, I believe that the idea that some lives matter less is the root of what's wrong in the world. You know, and that applies and that, to everything, human and non-human. Exactly. And where did it start? It started with the domestication of animals and plants. That's where speciesism started. Mm -hmm. Because speciesism can apply to animals, but it can apply to plants too. And now we've created these cultivars that we call food that can't survive on their own in the wild any more than a pig. If, you know, like a Yorkshire pig, if it, is, it was a, if you let it try to live on its own here in New York, they would die in the wintertime. They just don't carry the body fat. And they're not, you know, pigs just aren't, aren't uh, native to northern climates anyway. But, um, yeah, it's, it's a really skewed system. And, you know, we've, we do what we can. But, um, you know, that's really part of what my activism has kind of evolved into. And I've always believed that, you know, the activist world, needs to stop looking for leaders and heroes. They, if you're looking for one, go home and look in the mirror because the person's going to change the world. Your reality is right here, right now. And it's the person in front of you, you know, and it's learning how to communicate, being a student of human nature, learning how to live in the moment. And for me, I have a good friend who just passed away who taught animal law at Cornell. And she always asked me, she says, I have such a short view as with people who just don't get it. And I said, how do you have the patience to, you know, talk to people, to engage them and have these long conversations? And I said, I look at them and I just say, and I think we all can, but for me in particular, I just say, there for, there for the grace of God, I was. How can I judge anybody? I can't judge, you know, somebody who's still eating animals and say, you're a bad person. But yet, you know, I see activists that call farmers and farm workers evil human beings. You know, I, I get that. But they have to understand that these harms, these injustices, what happens on, you know, on the farm, that's the overt harm. But above that is a, um, I guess what you'd call a managerial harm. And these are people who are, may not, may or may not be directly engaged with the animals, but they're the ones who say, this is the work that needs to be done and it has to be done in this schedule and so on. And then above that, you have what I call institutional harms. And those are the people at the top end of this vertically integrated system of food production, and um, which is driven by the market and, uh, you know, market forces. So the, it's really a top-down thing that makes that happen at the bottom end. And... Um, I don't believe anybody is beyond redemption. Yeah, I think that um, before we leave, I just want to uh, mention one thing. As you were telling your story when you were younger, you were, you know, conditioned by your family, society, and where you were. And that's what happens to all of us wherever we are, number mm -hmm. one. Number two is... Um, However, as a child, you kind of, you didn't want to eat Max. So there was already a spark in you that knew that that was not right. Um, 
And um, so I want to say thank you from going to the other side of the fence, as we spoke before, um, and becoming a vegan activist, which shows that it doesn't matter where you start off, you can get to veganism. Because once you do as you did, educate yourself and find out more that you see what the right choices are for you. And mm -hmm. you see that animals are individuals and should be allowed to live their lives. Right. So I want to thank you for your time. And until next time, Harold, bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us on another Vegan Pulse. I am your host, Nancy Arenas. Remember, check out our website, like us on Facebook, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you have a pulse, you have a purpose. The vegan. <laughs>